From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. But how much of the history around big government do we really understand? Joining us to sort through that in this episode is Brian Ballow, an historian at the University of Virginia, co-host of NPR's Backstory with the American History Guys, and author of a new book on the history of governance in the 20th century with the very sexy title, The Associational State. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Doug. The standard way of talking about the role of government in American life has been Democrats always want bigger and bigger government, more services and more taxes, and Republicans want as little government as possible. Now, you seem to argue in your book and other things you've written that that's something of a fairy tale about American politics. Yeah, uh, certainly what you said is true uh, about the standard story since the New Deal. Uh, Democrats since the New Deal have been the advocates of big government. Uh, and starting after World War II, really, Republicans have strongly uh, opposed the growth of the government. That's the way the story goes. Uh, in your introduction, uh, you talked about, do Americans want a big government? Answer, no. Uh, do they want a powerful government? Answer, yes. Uh, and that's just as true for Republicans, I think, as for Democrats over the last 100 years or so. Um, unfortunately, the way uh, we tell that story, and I include among us, uh, certainly historians and, and scholars, uh, we, we tend to reinforce this notion that Republicans don't want government. Uh, Are you saying that's actually not the case? It is, it is not the case. I think what most Americans want and this is Republicans and Democrats, is they want the services that government provides, but they literally don't want to see the government, and they certainly don't want to deal face-to-face -face with a, bureau a bureaucrat who might exercise some direct control over their life. They don't want to deal with a public servant. But so how did we end up at, uh, at the, an oversimplified, I mean, this is such a basic thing, we seem to talk about it all the time, particularly in today's politics, it's at the very forefront of all sorts of questions like the Affordable Care Act and other things that we'll get to in more detail. But, but why is it that, if, if, if the fairy tale and the conventional telling isn't quite right, how did we end up with this? Is it just a matter of politics and misrepresentation? How many hours do we have, Doug? <laughs> The short story is that actually a vast majority of Americans were proud of their government from the New Deal, uh, really, through the mid-1960s. Uh, if you want to be popular, you disassociate yourself with the federal government. You establish the benefit and, and, uh, and the credit for it, but then you keep the, uh, the, the, the role of the federal government. Right, out of the but picture. Doug, you haven't asked me, well, how do we do that? We do that by relying on what I call intermediary institutions. And most of our governance is done, not by federal officials wearing uniforms, but by contractors, by professional groups, by trade associations. We're sitting right here at the University of Virginia in one of the best examples in a research university. So if you go look at the you know, University of Virginia Medical School, people think, oh, that's a hospital, that's a voluntary institution, maybe a little state money for dear old UVA. No, 200 out of $300 million for research comes from the federal government. But it's not terribly visible. You don't have folks in uniform walking around the medical school at UVA. Yeah, we'll talk about that because I think that's one of the things in, in the book that you, uh, that you bring forward in ways that, uh, that I think are pretty original in terms of that it's not just a discussion of big government versus small government. Uh, it's about how we, how we evolve through these many other institutions of society that, in a, that but whether they're working directly on behalf of the government or simply working as that village operation, but mm -hmm. on a bigger scale. But that's how we learn to expect some sort of organizational support in life. Right. Because I know your book doesn't really do this. We don't want, this isn't just about disabusing uh, everyone of the, uh, of a conservative uh, version of these events. I mean, there's a, there's a misunderstanding of this. I get progressives very angry, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm well, an equal opportunity, well, get we, people angry kind of guy. We definitely want to get to that. But, but uh, it is fascinating to me, though, that in the context of this, 
when you look at the numbers about how Americans feel about the government, when you just ask them that, what do you, uh, what do you, or do you have a positive feeling about government? Do you think government works well? Those sorts right. of questions. Uh, very recent data on this. 50% of Americans agree that they want a smaller government providing fewer services. 42, 42% say the opposite. They like a bigger government. Uh, but what's even more interesting to me is that 55%, uh, a solid majority, say government is almost always wasteful and efficient. And so a strong majority of us believe the government actually can't do anything uh, well. And then 39% think the government uh, actually does a better job than people gr give it credit for. So that's a big gap. You know, 55% think government's inherently bad. Th only 39% think it's inherently good and successful. Mm -hmm. But so how is it that we ended up, I mean, maybe you've already covered this, but it's still fascinating to me that, that we've ended up as such an anti-government uh, people on the whole. Uh, and yet we do live in this world in which the government is so fundamental, not just to the services provided, but the history of how we have become the society that we are. Well, I think if you look at public opinion, could I just add one statistic to those very good statistics? If you actually look at what services people don't support service by service, whether it's roads, whether it's the military, um, whether it's research, the only actual service that Americans say they don't support is that welfare, which again, we spend a fraction of what we spend on everything else for. So it's important to point out that whatever Americans' attitudes towards government in general, when you ask them about specific services, they support it. Yeah, Between wants. the early 1960s and the 1980s, Americans lost their trust in all forms of authority. And I think that one of the reasons that they lost their trust in authority is the government was pumping out more and more PhDs. The number of PhDs produced something like doubled or tripled between 1940 and 1960s. A lot of that was government subsidized funding to go to graduate school. And we, the more experts we got, what do you know, the more they argued with each other. So you tell me, Doug, is coffee good for you or bad for you? <laughs> so what you're really saying is change the old axiom and it should be first kill the PhDs. I'm all for PhDs. I suspect there are even a few sitting among our audience. But as those PhDs began to argue, as there were more of them, and as they began to argue with each other more visibly in public, those folks that brought us radar and brought us the atomic bomb during World War II, those folks that help us win the war all of a sudden seem to be at war with each other. Is coffee good for us or not? Uh, is the ozone layer disappearing or not? All of these debates and arguments going on in public really undermined public confidence. So that's not as dramatic as Vietnam or Watergate, but it's a very important phenomenon that's going on exactly in the period where Americans lost a lot of faith in authority. Well, a lot of people on the left don't trust anything that might possibly connect state and church. Uh, that's really where I part ways with a lot of people on the left. I believe that religious organizations have been essential uh, in providing charities to Americans throughout American history, and I, I think that they've done, in many instances, a pretty good job. And I think the key to all of those is that they're a lot closer to the people. This is why people tend to trust state and local government, some people, more than the national government. And this is why they tend to trust uh, charitable organizations or religious organizations, because they can touch them, feel them. They're, they feel closer. To the people. So, well, there, I mean, this, is an, uh, this gets at another one of the fundamental divides, as you say, that we're progressives, generally speaking, are much more hesitant about religiously based groups. But on the other hand, conservatives have been much more emphatic about that government services ought to be turned over to some faith based groups. And even, even Democratic administrations have embraced that to some degree, yes. perhaps out of political necessity. But there's also been this big focus on philanthropy, the idea that that, that rich folks and their good hearts and good intentions uh, ought to be the ones to shoulder a bigger part of the burden here, uh, and that that's better because it's an individual decision that's being made rather than taking tax dollars from every single person. But is, does that work? You know, is, is philanthropy in current times, 
does that really work as a way of accomplishing these sorts of aims? Well, again, I'll point out that that philanthropy in terms of hundreds of millions and eventually billions of dollars didn't start until it came with a hefty tax deduction. So I would not ignore the federal incentive uh, for philanthropy in the United States. Uh, yeah, I think it can be very effective. I would, I would point to the Ford Foundation's programs uh, in the late 1960s, or actually the mid-1960s, that became the model uh, for many of the social services that we enjoy today for housing, for reviving uh, the economies of urban neighborhoods. So yeah, I think in some instances it can be very effective. Uh, the, as a percentage of the GDP, the, the, the spending of the federal government today is, uh, is meaningfully lower than what the average has been since, I think, 1947. You know, we're, so I mean, we actually, by some measures, we've got a government that is as small as it's been since World War II. Uh, you know, depending 1947 on is a fairly unique point in American yeah, history. Well, the, uh, it's bigger than it was a decade ago, but it's still very consistent with uh, the range of where yeah. things have been. Look, Doug, I wouldn't argue with you about your general point, and I think what makes it particularly hard to measure the size of government is you talk about the military. The military over the last 20 years, as we know from just reading the headlines, has undergone a massive handing over of many of its functions to contractors and the private sector. Those are still federal dollars, in some instances a lot of federal dollars, paying for those services. And they range from Blackwater, uh, which is rather notorious, uh, to really pedestrian mundane things that add up to hundreds of billions of dollars, like providing food and housing for soldiers. Much of that has been contracted out. Ironically, it was Ronald Reagan who wanted to provide services directly to military people. I mean, under Reagan's administration, uh, a scholar by the name of Jennifer Middlestadt argues, under Reagan's administration, the army became a giant welfare. Uh, agency. Very ironic for a guy who didn't like welfare at all. Why did he do that? We had just converted to an all-volunteer army. And he was having a lot of trouble recruiting people. How do we recruit people? Well, you need to make the army attractive for them and their families. And there were lots of news stories in those days about soldiers and their families who were starving or who had less exactly. money Exactly, and you were probably welfare. writing some of those news stories. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so the, the real sense of that need, and, the, and it was okay though, that's another axiom of American life, I guess, is that, uh, that it's okay to, uh, to provide services or to, make, to be certain that, that our servicemen and other people put themselves in harm's way or not mistreated by society. That's why there's so much interest in the Veterans Affairs Administration these right. days. But we don't typically extend that same fervor to the rest of the population. Right. And, and in the last 20 years, the Army's motto has shifted from we take care of our own to you need to take care of yourself or some version of that. It's a pretty dramatic change in their messaging. Uh, and what it signals is, well, we can't be a welfare agency. And when we are a welfare agency, we're going to contract this out. Uh, you're going to get your services from a for-profit private contract. Uh, I mean, my family, for sure, coming out of poverty in Louisiana is a poster child for, uh, for government intervention, lifting people out of poverty and creating opportunity. And now almost all the people I'm related to in the world are, would, would say that those sorts of ideas are terrible and wrong. Well, I think there's a very simple explanation for that, Doug, and that's that especially in today's economy, meaning the economy of the last really 30 years, people don't see the pie growing, they feel their benefits are very much, oh, here's my second political science term, a zero-sum game, meaning if other people get medical care, that's going to come out of my hide because I have medical care. Uh, and you're quite right. If you were a middle-class American or even a lower middle-class American, you were male and you were white, you received a remarkable set of benefits either provided directly by the federal government or subsidized through tax expenditures by the federal government. These people are now uh, just about the average age of the folks in the Tea Party, and they want to hold on to those benefits. 
Uh, and that's, I think, human nature. They don't state it that way, though. They state it as we want, we're against big government. And we, yeah, we want uh, to even as they receive those government yeah, we benefits. Should all stand and alone. and, and, right. and uh, I, I, you know, I simply, I, honestly, I think many of my own colleagues in the historical profession, even among some of the best scholars, have reinforced this by emphasizing ideology, by talking about liberalism versus conservatism, rather than looking at the changing sets of people's material interests, who's excluded, who's not. So that when African Americans come along and want benefits, those benefits tend to be doled out, that's a pun, uh, at least those old enough know that the dole meant welfare right. uh, during the Great Depression. So benefits doled out in highly visible ways that are just targets for ostracism, while folks who receive their benefits generations earlier uh, are sitting easy and have forgotten that uh, Medicare is even subsidized by the federal government. Yeah, it, it, it's an amazing thing. A couple of years ago, I, I, am, uh, I finally had to turn off the Facebook connection to this particular cousin of mine because I couldn't bear it anymore. <laughs> but uh, does that mean he doesn't exist anymore? No, he does. He does exist, but I, but his feed doesn't populate into what I see, I see. Uh, and it's better that way. Uh, but the, but this b w before I did that. Uh, I, I, one day, while after he had posted a bunch of things that were railing against the Affordable Care Act, and they're, they're certainly very legitimate, there's a legitimate basis for being critical of the Affordable Care Act. It has obviously yes, uh, has absolutely. issues and problems, and this isn't to say that there's no valid criticism of it. Uh, but he was posting a, a, a really vociferous stuff uh, about it, and finally one day I emailed him and I, I said, "Don't you remember where?" where everybody in the family went to the family were carpenters and you know when your dad uh, ran a saw through his thigh you know when our grandfather you know nearly died from an accident you know where did they go well they went to the charity hospital in Shreveport Louisiana you know where did your brother have his uh, his operation yeah. for his kidney done when we were kids well they went to the charity hospital because nobody in this family had health insurance because nobody at that rung of society did at that time but there's no connect there's no sense of connectivity that uh, that all that there's this long history of those sorts of benefits though they had different names uh, and, uh, and that today it, there ought to be at least some consideration of the fact that the Affordable Care Act or those sorts of ideas are not completely new. Right. And here's another criticism of the left. The left also forgets about that connectivity. They forget that Americans for decades and centuries really have been getting benefits that have been laundered through these intermediary institutions. So where do most Americans get their health care from? They get it from their employer. It doesn't come directly from the government. The government's involvement has been to subsidize the cost of that health care. So those who advocated a unipay, unitary payer system on the left of the Democratic Party, uh, those who argued for the public option, um, Perhaps in an abstract world, if we were starting from scratch, this might make the most sense. I'm really not sure myself. But we're not living in an abstract world. We're living after 50 years of lots of millions of Americans getting benefits in certain ways. And how do you increase benefits without scaring the heck out of the rest of Americans? How do you succeed politically? You do what Obama did, which is to turn to the health insurance companies. Uh, you know, the, these attacks on Obama for socialism, he's, Obamacare is completely administered through the health insurance companies, yes. not through some, you know, incredible government bureaucracy. So I think what I hear you saying, I think, is that the, while it's fairly easy for, and you may hear the criticism more frequently of that, the conservative version of, of criticism of something like the Affordable Care Act yeah. ignores the actual history of how we do things in America. Let's but, remember those people on the left yeah, but you're who are saying the left incredibly the same thing. critical of Obama. Yeah, and you're saying they, they, they are They wanted the Canadian system. They wanted a unitary payer system. Yeah. And so you're saying that they are as wrong in their perception uh, of, the, of, uh, of how this relates to history as the folks on the right are as wrong. I'm saying that they are not as sensitive to the politics of the historical evolution of healthcare uh, 
as the Obama people were. And I think that's one of the reasons that it passed. Fascinating. So what does all of this mean for the country going forward and in terms of uh, whether that means that precisely the presidential election that we're looking at, which does really represent a fairly amazing spectrum of, pers of positions on, on, on these ideas of how the government should relate to these dimensions of society and where other organizations should fit. So, but, but, so what does all this mean? And I, uh, historians don't like to talk about the future, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but, but where does this fit into the set of questions that face the country now? Well, I think it's very hard to uh, look at the general patterns uh, of, um, and it's early, Right, it's, uh, I was uh, watching cable network news the other night and uh, um, you know, somebody kept saying, it's just August and had to be reminded that it was actually September. But it's, it's early, right? And it's, you know, I say this cautiously, but it's hard to look at the early returns on the Republican or the Democratic side and not conclude uh, that we're, we're at one of those moments when people are just utterly fed up with politics as usual. But we did, and, and we, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, the, but, but so go with that a little further. I mean, because what we seem to have at the moment is about 30% of Republican voters uh, who are clearly are very turned on by a set of ideas right. that, 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 that says the very conventional version of the, these things, that that the government needs to be very small and that the great history of America is based on small government. But we've also got 30% of Democrats on the other side, or something like that, uh, who think that we haven't been nearly progressive enough, uh, and that maybe even and Hillary Clinton herself is becoming a considerably more left uh, figure in this campaign. But so we seem to have a presidential election that has, uh, has set up that there are very strong, forceful groups uh, holding on to the most conventional versions of this story, and the question is, what happens? I don't in the know that they're holding on to the most conventional versions. I think what they are doing is expressing their outrage, just as those who voted for George Wallace in 1968 or 1972 were expressing their outrage with the system. And you know, I think that there may be more shared between a Bernie Sanders voter and a Ben Carson or Donald Trump voter, believe it or not, than we might think, and what's shared is frustration with the existing system. It's my contention that as long as we think settling this big government, small government thing once and for all is gonna solve this problem, someone's gotta win. People who look at demographics say, oh, the Democrats will win and things are in their favor. I think as long as we frame it that way, People will continue to be frustrated. What, you asked me about the future of the country. I think it's till we understand our history, odd that I would come to this conclusion as a historian. I think it's till we understand our history better uh, and begin to shape the debate in ways that talks about how can the government collaborate and use the resources outside of the government better. And until we accept that all Americans want some entity and some set of entities to help them act collectively. Uh, until we really understand that and accept that, we're not going to get off the dime and the frustration with the existing system is just going to grow. In other words, until the rhetoric of political contest comports with the history of the way the government has actually acted, uh, I, I, I think we're in for a tough time. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum.